You know, I have a uh, pastor friend when I was uh, still up in Wichita, and one of the things that he would say uh, to uh, the maybe the pastor that was preaching that Sunday, and I know that when he heard that I was going to seminary, he would uh, give me this greeting. He would say, Chris, go out and give him heaven. And I share that with some other pastor friends of mine because, you know, it's true. Heaven does change everything. How, how we live our life, how we have that perspective. I did that to one pastor friend of mine. I told him on a Sunday morning, we were texting back and forth, give him heaven. I said, no, give him Jesus. I said, well, yes, we give him Jesus so that they can live with that perspective of heaven on their mind. Because if, if you're a part of my good and beautiful God classes, you know that heaven isn't just a place that we go to when we, we leave this earth. Heaven is right here and right now. And that's what Jesus taught. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven has come near. So we can access heaven right here and right now where we are. We, we don't have to wait for that one day when we leave this earth. We can experience heaven right here and right now. That's why we're talking about being alive. Being alive in the word. Be, being alive as followers of Jesus Christ in Royce City Methodist Church in Royce City, Texas in the country of the United States of America in this global world we are called to be alive and active and, and moving and doing all the things that God has called us to do. So as you prepare to hear God's word today, I invite you to go to God in prayer with me. Let us pray. Oh God, we know that heaven changes everything. It changes everything because it is near us, it is in us, it is around us. And we are called to live within that kingdom of heaven right now. So Lord, we pray that as we move through this scripture, and as we continue to move through this series, we ask that you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. I don't know if you ever had a chance to see uh, a, a video or maybe you've been on a beach or near a, a creek or a river and, and somebody has come along and they've stacked these stones and, and they're, they're, they're beautiful artwork. Uh, it's just uh, stacking, you know, I've, I've done that here or there, but mainly because I've been bored and I've been sitting somewhere just looking for something to do. But, you know, to see somebody actually do that who knows what they're doing, it's breathtaking. I didn't want to post any pictures of it uh, just because I want you to explore that yourself. I want you to see that. Now, I know that it can get a little bit into the the, the new ages type of stuff. But, you know, when we talk about stone stacking, when we talk about using those things, I think it gives us a little bit of a picture of what Jesus has called us to do as his disciples and what we find in our scripture for this morning from 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 10, the ability to, to take what God has given us and build that into something that can make a difference. That, that can build into something that can be alive, even though we're just talking about stones. But when we really understand about living stones, how that can elevate us, if you will, into a way to share what God has given us in a powerful and remarkable way. So I invite you to follow along with our scriptures. Our scripture is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. If you don't have your Bibles with you, we'll have the words printed on the screen for you to follow along this morning. Hear the word of the Lord. As you come to him, the living stone, 
rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scriptures it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this, believe that this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected had become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praise of him who calls you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once, you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When we take a look at this scripture, the very first thing that I saw was that, that first proclamation about who Jesus is. Jesus is the living stone. Jesus is the, the living stone. He is what we are all built upon. And that means that Jesus is reliable. That means Jesus is dependable. That means that Jesus is the one that we can go and get all of the answers, the source, the, the, the comfort, all of the things that we need, we find that in and through Jesus. Ephesians talks about Jesus as being the chief cornerstone. And I know that I've used this example before. So for those of you who have heard it before, just, just kind of pretend like you're hearing it again. And for those of you who are hearing it for the first time, I, I hope this makes sense. When I did youth ministry, we uh, did a trip down to Juarez, Mexico, and we worked with a ministry called Proyecto Abrigo. And, and this ministry, what they did, they, they found uh, people who lived in Juarez who were living in homes that they went to the, the close-by junkyard, and they grabbed pallets and, and cardboard and, and plywood and, and all of these different scraps of things, and, and they would fashion themselves a house, which, you know, with those materials that I just shared with you, it's not that good of a house, it's a very poor house that, that could easily fall over or if something were to happen and something were to catch on fire, it would, that all of their possessions and even maybe them themselves would, would, would go up in flames. So Proyecto Abrigo, their, their mission was to build new homes for, for these families, but in building these homes, they would build concrete cinder block homes. And the beautiful thing about it is that youth would flock down there, and youth groups would flock down there to be a part of this ministry. Now, we talk about building houses, and you talk about youth groups. Some of you may be uh, kind of bristling right now, going, well, how in the world would you allow something like that to happen? How, how could you be sure that the house would be stable enough for somebody to live in? Well, that's because each house had what they called a, a maestro. A, and the maestro was the one who would give all of the instructions for, for what the youth and the other uh, adult volunteers or adult servants that were there with them were to help them as, as they built up this house. A, and it would start by digging a trench and then pouring in some, uh, some cement around in the trench. And then the maestros would do something very, very important. The maestros would look at the youth and say, get away from here. <laughs> Move. I don't want you anywhere near me. 
And so the youth and the adults that were there serving would watch as the maestro would lay the cornerstone. He, he would take the corner of one side of the house and he would lay the concrete cinder blocks in such a way that when the youth started to put the other cinder blocks on, they couldn't mess it up. They, they, they couldn't make a house that would fall over or, or, or be disabled or, or, or do anything that would harm the people inside because the work that was done in setting the cornerstone set the course of the house so that the house would be built correctly. How does that repair, compare to Jesus? Jesus sets the course for us. Jesus sets the course for us. When we, when we put our eyes on him, just as the maestro placed the cornerstone of the concrete cinder block house for, for the youth to finish building the home, Christ does that for us. He gives us what we need so, so that if we build our life, our foundation, ourselves on him, we know that whatever goes on in our life, whether it's a couple of youth that are goofing around and maybe bump up against the side of the wall of the house, which may have happened, it's easy to bring it back in alignment so that you know that the house is safe and secure. A and the work that is done around that house will continue to grow and continue to experience the love and grace of Jesus Christ. But we have a problem. And our scripture talks about the problem. This cornerstone was rejected. Can you imagine if the maestro did all of that work on that concrete cinder block home and, and, and did what he needed to do to get everything and the youth and the adults that came said, you know what, whatever, I mean, we're just going to forget what he did, and we're just not going to follow the path that the maestro gave us. We would have a disaster. My friends, that's what happens in our lives. When we fail to follow and live in what that chief cornerstone has given us to do, that chief cornerstone in Jesus Christ, our lives can become a disaster and fall apart. Jesus came into Jerusalem. And in, in Matthew chapter 21, he, he tells a parable of a um, landowner who, who decided to put in a, a new fence. He put up a watchtower and he put all of these vineyards inside of this land that he had. And he, he went away and he hired somebody to, 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 to work over the land. And then when he decided it was time for him to collect what was due him, he, he sent servants to go collect from these, these workers. And the workers looked at the, the servants and said, yeah, we're not going to do anything for them. We're, we're just going to beat them up and send them along and let the landowner know that we're the ones in charge. And it happened again and again and again. All of these servants that were m abused and and mistreated and, and sent away without what they were supposed to receive. And then the landowner said, you know what, I'll, I'll do something even greater. I will send my son. Surely they will have respect for him and they will do what he has asked them to do. And as the workers of the field saw that the sun was coming, they realized, you know what, what we'll, we'll, we'll do, we'll really show him and we'll show him that we're the ones in charge. We'll, we'll kill the sun and that way everything will be ours. And they followed through that plan. And the sun was killed and the landowner said, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to go take it over myself. And he came and he, he took over and Jesus said, what what does this show you as you were listening? They're saying that the, the landowner was in the right because they did not listen to the son. And Jesus says, guess what? The landowner has sent 
the Son. And, and I am giving you what you are to do, and you are not listening to what I'm supposed to do. And then Jesus quotes these words from Psalm 100. And 18, that says, the stone that the builders rejected had become the cornerstone. And the Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The, the, the stones that, that the people of Israel rejected, that was the cornerstone. And my friends, we here today have the option whether to accept that cornerstone in our lives or reject it and see that our lives can easily fall into ruin because we want to build things our own way and not follow the master plan and the cornerstone that has been laid for us. So while, while, while Jesus is the living stone, guess what that makes us? That, that, that makes us all living stones. Because the, the guide and, and the step of being a follower of Jesus Christ is that we want to be like him. We want our lives to reflect him. And we want our lives to be secure in Jesus Christ. When we take a look at John chapter 6, 23, he reminds us that all that the Father has given me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. <clears throat> one of the times when we were working in uh, Mexico, Juarez, one of the uh, cinder blocks broke, and the maestro said, no worries, no problem, no problem. A and, and he took the cinder block, and he was able to put some of the concrete in and, and put the cinder block back together. A and then we were able to put the cinder block into the house. And, and while we were questioning, are you sure that's going to be safe? No, it's totally fine because it's that secureness of the cornerstone. And it's the secureness of all of the other cinder blocks around it that will make it do the work it is supposed to have. Kind of sounds like the church, doesn't it? Sometimes we come to the church broken. Sometimes we come to the church maybe missing a little part of ourselves. But when we have the body of Christ around us, we know that we are safe and secure. Not, not because of the people here, but because... We have built our lives on the chief cornerstone of Jesus Christ. And when we build our lives on the chief cornerstone of Jesus Christ, we know that we are chosen people. In John chapter 15, verse 16, Jesus is talking to the disciples and he's talking to us and he says, You did not choose me, but I chose you. See, when Jesus was meeting up with the disciples, he, he wasn't like waiting to hear a, a resume from, from them. He was saying, no, I want you to become fishers for men. I, I want you to, to leave being a tax collector and come and follow me. I want you to leave all that you have and be my apprentice. Jesus calls us all to be a part of who he is, to live within this new covenant that, that he has established through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, and through his ascension. All of those things, each and every one of us are called to be a part of and, and to play a part, an important role within our lives so that we can share with others that, that, that we did not just say that Jesus is our Lord, but Jesus first said that you are mine. And when we live within that new covenant, we have a, a task when we are chosen. And that task is that we are appointed so that we may go out and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. And as we close our series next week about being and bearing fruit, you will talk more about that, but we'll kind of put that aside 
for next week. Another thing that, that Jesus tells us and that, Paul, that Peter tells us through his scriptures is that we are a royal priesthood. That we now have direct access to God through Jesus Christ. See, see that wasn't the thing. When, when, when Jesus came, you, you had to go through a, a, a mediator. You, you had to go through the priest in order to be able to have access to God. But when, when Jesus came, he said, we're, we're taking away all of that, that you, do no lo- you no longer have to have a mediator to go between you and God. You can go to God through yourself. And one of the ways that we do that is through God's word. When we we take a look at scripture, we see how we have a relationship with God. But this is not, this is fairly a new thing for us. New thing, we're talking about 500 years when the Gutenberg Bible was was printed. And that that allowed us to be able to have access to, to read through the scriptures ourselves and to understand what it is that God has for us. And and you don't have to rely on someone to tell you God's plan for your life, but you can experience that on your own. We're we're in the middle of one of these big, giant media shifts right now with social media and with TikTok. And, And while social media and TikTok can be used for horrible things, we as a church try to redeem what TikTok and what Facebook and what Instagram can do. That's why I do a daily prayer on, on those platforms is because I want what I present out into the world through social media to lift people up, to allow people to experience God's love through these ancient prayers that have been around for a long, long time, to, to hear the word of God maybe in a fresh new way that allows them to see a God that loves and cares for them. We, as royal priesthood, we have access through prayer. We we no longer have to to have somebody pray for us, even though corporate prayer is, is wonderful, and I love it when a group of people come together and they lift up in prayer, but we can lift up our prayers to God on our own. And then finally, another way to become a royal priesthood is that we have access to God through other living stones. <clears throat> Yesterday we had this Beth Moore simulcast. I believe we had 20 women that came to uh, Wesley Hall and, and listened to a day of teaching by Beth Moore. And, and it was absolutely amazing. And I think the thing that I thought was absolutely amazing, there was a group of ladies Somehow I got uh, connected within this, got started a group text, a- and they started to ask questions and to say, what did you learn from this? You know, what, what can we take forward? That's what it means to be living stones. It's not just taking the word yourself and just saying, boy, I really got something from that, so I'm just going to go home and just live my life how it was, but no, it's... It's saying, okay, how can we take what we have received and then together grow in that? <clears throat> Men, there's a chance for you all, too. This upcoming Monday, we're starting a monthly prayer time at 6.30 in the morning. I know it's early, and I know some of you are, are traveling or, or driving to work at that time, but if you want to be a part of that, come join us over at Wesley Hall at 6.30. We're going to spend some time in the Word, and we're going to spend time in fellowship, and we're going to spend time getting these small stones together, these living stones together so that we can make a magnificent impact of the world that God has given us. And finally, Peter says that we are a holy nation. And what that means is that we are called to be different than the world around us. That we are called to, to live this in this set-apartness life. The set apartness life is a theme throughout all of scriptures. When you look at the, the Israelites, they were called to be set apart from the world around them. 
we are also called to be set apart. And in 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16, he writes, But just as he who called you is holy, so you be holy in all you do, because it is written, Be holy because I am holy. That's a big task. I know it is. It's a huge task to to live our lives holy. There's a lot of noise that are out there right now telling us we must live one way or another. But my friends, I want to live in the way of Jesus Christ. And I hope that you want to join me in living in that way too. And there are two things that I know that we can do in order to live our lives as a holy nation. The very first thing is that we must have a vision of a good and beautiful life in Jesus Christ. We must have this this beautiful vision of who Jesus is and what Jesus has come to do for each and every one of us so that we may be holy just as Jesus is holy. Vision is a difficult thing. I heard that... Nine out of ten times when, when people drift or, or, or go a different direction, it's because they've lost sight of their vision. That's why we repeat over and over and over again. And when we think that we have it, we repeat it again because we know it takes time and time to allow the vision of who Jesus is and a, a vision of how to live that good and beautiful life in Christ can help us to grow. The second thing, and this is something that we're working on as a church, is that we must have a vocabulary and a map on how to get there. The words that we use, the, the, the way that we do it, the, the actions that we do that, if we don't have a vision or we don't have a vocabulary and a map, we may as well just be wandering in the wilderness just like the Israelites did. But we have the way. We have the truth, and we have the life. And we know that that all comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is the living stone that we build our lives on so that we may be renewed and rooted in him. Let us pray. Dear God, I thank you that you are the living stone. And when we we guide up our lives with you, we can then feel refreshed and renewed. When we guide up our lives with you, we know that we are on the path that you have chosen for us. You don't force us to stay on that path. You allow us the freedom to, to move from that path. But God, I don't see why we would want to. Because your way is good and your way is beautiful. And when we as a community of faith live within that guidance, we then can take the opportunity to share that love with others. So God, help us this week as we continue to find ways to make sure that we are aligned in you so that we may share your love with others. And so Lord, we lift this up in the name of Jesus, in the presence of Jesus, and in the great power of Jesus our Lord. Amen.